page 1127, uh, Luke chapter 9, starting from verse 18. A few more pages have been there. Once, when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, Who do the crowd say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. But what about you, he asked, Who do you say I am? Peter answered, God's Messiah. Jesus strictly warned them not to tell anyone this. And he said, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed, and on the third day be raised to life. Then he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, and yet lose or forfeit their very self? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory, and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. Brilliant. It's great to be with you uh, this morning. Can I add my welcome to Peter's as we dig into God's word together? Now, in the summer of 1884, C.T. Studd was on top of the world. This is him. He'd had the best start to life that his parents could possibly have prepared him for. He'd studied at Eton. He'd studied at Trinity College, Cambridge. He came from a wealthy family. He had loads of connections. And to top it all, he just played a key part in England's victorious campaign down in Australia to reclaim the ashes. He was on top of the world. He was a household name, famous throughout the nation, honoured and adored. He had the world at his feet. He could do anything he pleased. And yet, when his brother George became seriously ill, he was left questioning what all the fame and flattery was worth. He said this, he said, I know that cricket would not last, and honour would not last, and nothing in this world would last. But it was worthwhile living for the world to come. And so, with that, he turned his back on England, and he headed off to China to help Hudson Taylor as they set up the China Inland Mission. When his father died a few years later, he inherited what would be more than three million pounds today, and he gave it all away to Christian churches and charities to give him, and continue to just give his life to preaching the gospel in China, in America, in India and Africa. In 1956, Elizabeth Elliot learned that her husband Jim, that they'd been married just three years, he'd landed on a remote beach in Ecuador and just five days later he was speared to death by a Native American tribe. And just two years later, Elizabeth took her one-year-old child, their three-year-old child and a friend, and they went back to that very tribe that had killed her husband. She lived with them for five years, and she taught them the great news about King Jesus. And in God's mercy, she saw many of them come to put their trust in him. Paul. Paul, Paul graduated from university a few years ago, and he'd done well, he got a job in a prestigious London city bank, and Paul decided that even though he was earning a six-figure income, that he was still going to live on what he lived on as a student. And he gave away all the extra to churches, to charities committed to preaching the gospel giving almost all of his money away, and he had to ignore all those people around him who were telling him that he was foolish and he should have other priorities. John. John was a teacher in an ordinary town in the north of England. John had a wife and kids, and money was tight, but they got by. Now, John's church was gearing up for a building project, and John and his wife decided that they would remortgage their house to be able to give £15,000 to the project. 
It set them back years and years and years in their goal of paying off the mortgage. Now, I could give you countless more examples of folk down the ages who have done seemingly crazy things in the name of Jesus. But why do they do this? Why would anyone turn their backs on the comfort of this world and give, and give it all away? What drives a person to turn away from the success and the glory that this world offers and to plow themselves into the hard slog of working for Jesus' glory? Well, if we keep listening this morning, then I hope we're going to see the reason. We'll get that vision that drove those people to do those crazy things for Christ. If you've closed your Bible too, please reopen it to Luke 9 as we work through it together. Because over the next four weeks, we'll be diving into this middle section of Luke's Gospel. We'll be coming face to face with who Jesus truly is and what it will look like to follow him as we see him lay out the path of the cross. But before I give too much of, of that away, let's turn to our passage today and our first point, recognising the Messiah. Recognising the Messiah. Do have a look down at your Bibles at verse 18 with me. Luke says, Once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, Who do the crowds say I am? Luke, the writer of the, this gospel, has this story of Jesus' life has taken great care in how he has prepared his account of Jesus' life. He doesn't waste his words, and he uses lots and lots of devices to draw our attention to key parts of his book. And he sets the scene for us today by telling us that Jesus is praying in private with his disciples. And I'm sure that is something that Jesus did regularly. But Luke only highlights it at key points in his story at key points in Jesus' ministry. When Jesus prays, Luke says, pay attention to what happens next. And what does he do? He launches us into a conversation with the disciples. Who do the crowds say that I am? Now the crowds are, they're Luke's collective term for all those folk who have been present at some part of Jesus' ministry so far. Wherever Jesus is, the crowds are there. Luke mentions them 38 times through the Gospel. And their reaction to Jesus acts as a bit of a bellwether, a bit of a, a test as to how Jesus is being received. Whenever Jesus gathers to teach, the crowds are there. When he heals, when he drives out demons, the crowds are watching. These crowds have been made up of all sorts of different people. There have been young people, old people, rich people, poor people, men, women, tax collectors, and religious leaders. Now they've all heard his teaching about the coming kingdom of God. They have heard his call to repent, to turn back to God, to put their faith in God. They've seen his power and authority as he's performed miracles, as he has healed. And in the section immediately before this, He's seen them turn five fish and two loaves of bread, a little lunch, into a feast for over 5,000 people, with baskets and baskets left over. Jesus has been patiently teaching and showing people who he is. But have they understood? Have a look at how the disciples answer in verse 19. They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. Have they got the message? Have they understood who Jesus is? Is there, is there Jesus clarity among the crowds? Well, apparently not. Apparently not. They have got it right in some regards. They have recognised that Jesus is something special, someone special. Recognise that he is no ordinary man. Recognise he's from God. They know he's definitely special. But all three of their suggestions are equally unlikely, aren't they? Some have got him confused with John the Baptist. Now, John was beheaded by King Herod not long before this, but he's back. Some think he's a titan of the Old Testament. Elijah, the biggest, the best prophet in Israel's history, who rode off to heaven in a chariot of fire. 
Some think that he must be another of God's prophets from all that long ago. All of them are, are improbable answers. They're unlikely, aren't they? You're either the guy who's just had his head chopped off, come back, or a guy who's been dead for several hundred years, or the guy who rode off to heaven in a chariot of fires, come back. Simply put, they knew Jesus was special. They recognised he was powerful. But they didn't actually know who he was. And so Jesus turns his attention, turns the question on the disciples. Those that have walked and talked and slept and eaten with Jesus throughout the years, uh, through, through his ministry so far. Well, what do they say? Have a look at, at verse 20 with me. He says, but what about you? He asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, God's Messiah. Jesus puts them on the spot. Have they got it? The people that have been closest to him, have they understood who Jesus is? And Peter speaks up for them and he has nailed it. He has followed Jesus everywhere. He's heard him teach. He's seen his miracles, has seen the power, the authority, the wisdom. And has come to the realisation that Jesus can be none other than God's Messiah. The Christ, God's promised king, the son of David. God's king who's come to establish God's rule over God's kingdom. The one who all of God's promises point forward to. And as readers of Luke's gospel so far, we're meant to see the fireworks go off in celebration. The pyrotechnics proclaiming victory. They've understood who Jesus is. They've got it. And so now we can move on and understand what following him looks like. We can move on with the work of proclaiming his kingship. We're meant to see how great a revelation this is. Because if Jesus is God's Messiah, his promised king, come to establish God's kingdom, well then that changes everything. And so now they know who Jesus is. He needs to show them the path he must take. Which is our second point this morning, the path of the Messiah. Because the disciples are in for a proper shock. I'm fairly confident they were not expecting Jesus' response. Did you see it in verse 21? He said, Jesus said, Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. Now you can imagine the disciples, they're buzzing with excitement. And Jesus has just thrown a bucket of water over their heads. Told them to be quiet, to sit down. Why on earth is he doing that? Well, I think to understand that we have to appreciate what Israel were expecting from this Messiah. Now the Old Testament is littered with promise after promise after promise of what God's anointed king is going to do. But I think none of them are clearer than Psalm 2. I put it on the screen for us to see, to read through. Now for context, this is a psalm written by King David about a thousand years before Jesus lived. And what does he say? Well, Psalm 2 says, Why do the nations conspire? And the peoples plot in vain. The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. <coughs> David sets the scene for us. The psalm opens with the nations, all the peoples of the world who don't want to live with God as their king. They all come together, they plot, they scheme, they bring their armies together. And do you see their target? They want to overthrow the Lord and his anointed one, his Messiah. They want to defeat them, to break off their chains, to be free. Well, how's God going to react? Is he worried about this threat to his rule? Well, have a look how he continues. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. Well, God sees his rebellion and he just laughs. There is simply no way that their rebellion can win. 
and their situation gets worse. He terrifies them, did you see, in his wrath? By declaring that he has installed his king, his Messiah, on Zion, in Jerusalem. These nations and kings thought they were going to go up against God. But God is going to fight against them through his Messiah. The psalm goes on. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask me. And I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. God's Messiah, his anointed one, is going to be none other than God's own son. And God is going to give him the nations, all those ruled by these rebel kings, as his inheritance. He is going to rule them. More than that, he's going to rule the whole earth. The whole earth will be given to God's Messiah. There is no place where Jesus' rule will not be felt. And those that rise up against him, well, they're going to be shattered like pottery thrown on the floor, dashed. They'll be ruled with a rod of iron, broken, destroyed. And so look how the psalm ends. Therefore, you kings... Be wise, be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Kiss his son or he will be angry and your way will lead to your destruction. For his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. A call goes out to the kings of the earth to abandon their fight against God and his king. And instead, come and seek peace before it's too late. Come and take refuge in him. A call to be wise. A call to reflect on their folly and make peace with God. A call to to come over to the winning side and shelter behind God's Messiah rather than be destroyed by him. This is who Israel thought they were expecting, thought the Messiah was going to be. God's all-powerful, all-conquering king, who was going to come in, who was going to overthrow their enemies, going to throw out the Romans and establish God's kingship all over the world, starting in Jerusalem. Following him, they thought, was going to be a glorious victory parade, where they were going to get to join in his triumph. And for the last 700 years, Israel have been under consistent oppression. They've been ruled over by the Babylonians and the Persians and the Macedonians and now the Romans. Now, it's easy to forget in our Western comfort what living under the oppression of foreign rulers for centuries and centuries might have been like. Knowing that they were Israel, they were the ones that were meant to be God's treasured possession the means through which he was going to show his glory to the whole world. So it's easy to see how passages like Psalm 2 or Psalm 110, where God tells his anointed king to sit next to him while he defeats all of his enemies and he can use the nations as his footstool. You can see the attraction, the desire for this Messiah to come in and to overthrow the Romans, to overthrow the rulers. To overthrow their oppressors. That's that's a bit of the cultural weight that Israel were expecting. That they were waiting for. So you can imagine the disciples' shock, can't you? When Jesus says, shh, don't tell anyone. Keep my identity to yourself. And if that was a shock, then his next statement would have knocked them to the floor. Because Jesus' path to victory was going to take a very, very different path. Back in Luke 9, have a look down at at verse 22. And he said, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law. And he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. 
Now that is a million miles away from the disciples' expectations for the Messiah, isn't it? Jesus starts by, by confirming his credentials. They've definitely got it right. He definitely is the Messiah. He calls himself the Son of Man. That's a reference to a prophecy in Daniel chapter 7 where, where Daniel has a vision where he sees someone coming to God. And this person is given all authority, all power. He's going to be someone who is going to be worshipped by every nation, by people of every tribe and tongue. And he's going to rule a kingdom that will last forever and ever and can never be destroyed. Jesus really is the Messiah. But the Messiah's path is to suffer now and receive glory later. Because Jesus must suffer these many things. Did you see that? He must. He must be rejected by the elders and chief priests and teachers of the law. He must be killed and then three days later rise to life again. Jesus is the all-conquering king, but he's only going to become that king through rejection and suffering and death and resurrection. And that is a massive change to the, the expectations the disciples had, isn't it? He's ripped the rug out from under their feet. They thought he was going to ride in to Jerusalem to overthrow the Romans and be proclaimed king. But he's going there to die. But it's not time for that yet. Jesus isn't quite ready for everyone to know who he is. Because the disciples know that Jesus is God's Messiah. They know what Jesus is going to do now. But Jesus needs them to know what it's going to look like to follow the Messiah. That's our final point this morning, following the Messiah. Because no sooner has Jesus floored the disciples with his own path, he lays out what it means to be his disciples, to be one of his followers, what it will mean for them to submit to him as their king. Because it's a decision that they will each have to make. Remember Psalm 2. The choice God set before the world. The choice is to follow God's king, God's anointed one, or be destroyed by him. There isn't a third choice. There isn't another way. And Jesus' call to follow him is to set him as the supreme Lord of your life. It's a claim greater than any human could ever make. It's a life-changing decision. So Jesus shows them what it will look like. It's a path of suffering now for great glory later. And he's going to do it by giving us four pictures, four challenges, four contrasts that are going to help to us to see what the path of following the crucified Messiah is going to look like. Have a look at verse 23 with me. Jesus said, he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. The first picture is carrying their cross, denying themselves. It means saying no to their desires, their wants, their dreams, and instead placing them under Jesus' desires and wants and plans. That's not to say that all of their plans and dreams might not come about or won't be achieved, but Jesus is saying, You've got a higher calling now, if you're following me. You've got a higher plan. And all of their life is now going to fit into this new shape. That's going to spread through every aspect of life, every cell of their body. There is not a stone on the path ahead of them that does not fall within Jesus' kingship. And so the path of discipleship is going to be one of daily choosing to put Jesus first. To pick up our cross is to put all of our needs behind God's goals. To do it when that path leads to suffering and pain and hardship. When to trust Jesus means saying no to the easy option, the quiet life, and instead leads us into the lion's den or into the fire. Leads us to need to endure any and every suffering that might come our way. And to do it daily is a reminder and a challenge 
that this path is going to continue to be a battle. Every day when they wake up, the Messiah's disciples are going to have to choose to put Jesus first. Everywhere they go, everywhere they go everything they do, every relationship they have, needs to be put under the rule of Jesus. And it's something we all find so hard, isn't it? I'm constantly reminded of the challenge as we raise our two boys, Jacob and Ben. Every day is filled with us having to tell them that even though they really want to go and play outside, they have to eat their tea first. That even though they want to go and watch Bluey on TV, that they need to tidy up or they need to listen to mum and dad first. That even though they really want to jump off that high concrete wall onto the tarmac below, that they need to listen to us and to be safe. It's a constant battle for them to be told that they need to put their dreams and their desires on hold and to listen to us. Now we may be older than them, some of us may be a little wiser, but denying ourselves daily is going to be a continual, constant challenge. And if that's going to be hard, the second picture is even more stark. Have a look at verse 24. Jesus says, For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. If the disciples were unclear about the path ahead, Jesus was calling them to, he makes it crystal clear here, doesn't he? Come and lose your life. Life with Jesus as King is a life picking up our cross daily and following the path to the cross. It's a call that the world around us, the world we live in, ruled by those kings raising their fists to God, cannot bear to hear. Our world calls us to put ourselves first, to, to look after number one, to make sure that no one puts us down, to ensure that we achieve our goals, to achieve uh, to mean that no matter the consequences, no matter who gets in our way, that our goals, our needs are satisfied. Our world says, put your life first. But Jesus says, no. Jesus says, give up your life. Lose your life for me. Jesus says, following him is going to cost us our very life here and now. And not putting yourself first, not putting our dreams and our goals first, is going to cost us. Following Jesus is going to mean different decisions about how we spend our money, about how we spend our time, how we spend our holidays, how we, how we work at work, how we live at school, how we rest. It's going to change every single aspect of our life. And for some followers of Christ, just like Jim Elliot, who I mentioned at the start, following Christ will literally mean that you give up your life and die. The follower of Jesus, compared to the world around you, it's going to look like our decisions make us poorer. It's going to mean we miss out on some of the joys of this world. And that flows into the third picture, where we see following Jesus means losing the world means the disciples giving up on their dream of making their mark on the world. It flows straight from the last two. And if the disciples were harbouring any last hope that following God's anointed king was going to see them ruling in Jerusalem under him, they're going to be sorely disappointed. Just look at verse 25. Jesus says, What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? Following Jesus is, is saying no to what this world offers. It's saying no. It's saying that to gain the world now results in the forfeit of our souls. When you hear Jesus put it like that, it might seem obvious which way we should choose. Well, 300 years before Jesus lived, a chap called Alexander the Great came to the throne of the kingdom of Macedon, aged about 21. By the age of 33, he had conquered most of the known world at the time. He'd gone all the way from Greece right through to the borders of India. 
And a Roman poet, writing a few hundred years later, wrote this. When Alexander the Great was alive, the world was not big enough to contain his ambition. But while Alexander chafed at the confines of the world in life, in death, a coffin was enough. In death, a coffin was enough. Because we're embodied souls, aren't we? We have bodies, we have needs, we live in a physical world right now. And that world screams at us to follow in Alexander the Great's footsteps, to follow in the path of making our name, our mark on the world. It can be so, so hard to let that go, can't it? But Jesus says we need to turn our backs on living for the pleasures this world offers. And instead turn and follow Jesus on the path of hardship and suffering and carrying our crosses. Jesus knows this is going to be tough for his disciples. He needs them to know what's in store ahead. Because finally Jesus is going to show them what it will look like for their reputation in the world. Have a look at at verse 26. Jesus says, Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Life following Jesus as their king is going to mean a life of never being ashamed of Jesus. Never shying away when he says something that we don't like. A life taking pride in our king in any and every situation. Now that's easy, isn't it? When Jesus is popular, when the crowds love Jesus, when his teaching and calling is in line with the way our world thinks. But for the disciples, Jesus, he's just told them, hasn't he, that he's in for a run-in with the religious authorities and the rulers. That the things he's going to say and do are going to lead to him being pushed out of society. They're going to lead to him being put on trial for trusting in Jesus. To being put to death for following Jesus. In our world today, Jesus' words are not popular, are they? They're not deemed acceptable by an increasing portion of the world around us. In our schools, in our workplaces, in our societies, our homes, the temptation to keep quiet about Jesus when he is ridiculed, when his teachings are rubbished, when sin is praised and righteousness is derided, when topics of sexuality or pride or money or morality or abortion are raised. Jesus' followers must not be ashamed of their king and his words. Knowing that to do that might well cost us friends, might well cost us jobs, might cost us the chance to get married or have children. Knowing that to stand for Jesus may well land us in jail. Following Jesus as the Messiah means putting his reputation above our own. Now this truly is a call to suffer now, isn't it? To put our desires, our hopes for the future in this world, our reputation, our good standing, our very lives under God's anointed King. Why would anyone take up Jesus' offer to follow him if that's the cost? Well, because to follow Jesus now does mean suffering, but it also means eternal glory to come. So far we've just focused on the hardships that Jesus warns the disciples about. Which is right, isn't it? It's necessary. We need to know the cost of following Jesus. We need to know how hard it could get. Otherwise, when temptation comes, when the going gets hard, we might be tempted to give up. But with Jesus as their king, the disciples are going to get far, far more than they're giving up, aren't they? Have a look back through those verses with me and see the glory ahead that Jesus offers. Following God's anointed king means we actually get to be who we were made to be. It means we can live and walk in step now and in the future how God made us to be. What a privilege. 
The life following Jesus, even though it's going to be full of hardships, will be the best possible life we could live now. Living life as God intended it, following his Messiah, growing to love and know him better and better every single day as we walk in step with our King. Following God's anointed King will mean that they will lose their lives here and now, yes. But they're going to see the reward of living in eternal glory with God forever. In light of eternity, this short life will fade away. Following God's anointed king is, and losing the world now will mean that their souls will be saved, their cells will be saved. That they will gain an eternal kingdom unmarred by sin and brokenness and suffering and pain. Rejoicing in the glory of God's Son and his anointed King. And following God's anointed King and not being ashamed of him means that he will be honoured, that God and his anointed will be pleased with them, how they live their lives. The eternal King of the universe will be delighted by his disciples' faithful service. They are going to receive glory and honour and reputation and family and friendship and eternal joy that will last forever, that cannot be taken away. Yes, the life following Jesus to the cross will be costly here and now. But in perspective, Jesus knows that those hardships will be worth it for every single one of his followers. No one who follows Jesus will miss out. And that future kingdom is near. Did you see that final verse of our passage this morning, verse 27? Jesus says, Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. The kingdom Jesus is preaching and proclaiming is near. So near he can say with confidence, that some of those who are standing there will see it in their lifetimes. They are going to see the king come into his kingdom. They're going to see all the promises of the Old Testament come to fruition. They're going to see the kingdom of God come about that the whole world has been waiting for. Some of these disciples will be there in Jerusalem in a few months' time when Jesus will be taken by the priests. When he'll be tried, when he'll be flocked, flogged and mocked and put to death on a cross, when he'll be condemned to a criminal's death. Some of these disciples are going to be there three days later when Jesus rises from the grave. They'll be there with Jesus for 40 days as he teaches them about life in the kingdom, about what life is going to look like as they live for God in the light of the cross. What life will look like daily, taking up their cross and following God's Messiah. Many of them will be there when he ascends to heaven to take his seat at God's side. Many of these disciples do see this. They do see the kingdom come in power. And then they go out and they proclaim Jesus' kingship. And they suffer and die horribly. Eleven of the twelve Disciples are killed in horrible deaths around the world, taking the news of Jesus' eternal kingdom to the nations. And the only one who doesn't die horribly like that dies in exile on a remote island. Why did they do that? Why did they decide to follow God's Messiah? Well, they recognised who Jesus was. They heard his call to follow him. They understood what it would mean daily to pick up their crosses, to turn their backs on the pursuit of worldly glory and ambition and reputation and recognition. And they chose to joyfully serve their king with all of their hearts. And hundreds and thousands and millions and billions of people since have heard the call of Jesus and chosen to follow him joyfully no matter the consequences and given their lives to follow him. Well, let's conclude. Let's conclude. This morning, we've seen Jesus sketch out the life that he calls each and every person in this world to lead, doesn't he? There's so much there to unpack. 
It's going to take a lifetime to understand it fully, but let me ask you two quick questions now. Firstly, have you recognised the Messiah for yourself? Now, I'm new to this church this morning. I don't know many of you. I don't know your stories, but I'm, I'm aware that there are some folk here this morning who are still looking at Jesus for the first time. Some folk who are new to church, new to the Bible. Have you recognised that Jesus is God's Messiah, his promised King? Hopefully you've seen this morning that Jesus makes very, very big claims about himself. And that deciding to make him your king is going to be a massive decision, not to be taken lightly. But can I urge you this morning, keep looking at Jesus, keep examining the Bible, have a look and see what folk heard and what the disciples heard and saw that brought them to the point where, G where Peter boldly proclaimed that Jesus could be no one other than God's Messiah. Have you recognised the Messiah? And secondly, are you following the Messiah? Which of those four challenges do you struggle with most? That, that desire for recognition, for our future now, for a place, for a name in this world, for reputation and friendship. Can you see the weight of the call to follow him? When was the last time you took time to examine how that's going how you're finding it how following Jesus is going to be following Jesus now is hard it's going to be hard it's just easier to ignore Jesus to to put him on the back burner but Jesus endured that hardship because he knew the future was coming he knew the kingdom was coming he knew the day was coming when the whole world would sit down and see him sat on the throne in heaven, where every single person in heaven and on earth would see him for who he truly is and would rejoice in glory with him. Have you fixed your eyes on the kingdom to come? The kingdom that has come in Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension to God's side. As we close, C.T. Studd, who we started with, wrote a beautiful poem about what following Christ, about following what God's Messiah was like. If you've got time later, have a look at it and read it in full. But here's a little selection. He writes, Two little lines I heard one day, travelling along life's busy way, bringing conviction to my heart and from my mind would not depart. Only one life will soon be past. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one. Soon will its fleeting hours be done. Then in that day, my Lord to meet and stand before his judgment seat. Only one life, it will soon be past. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, the still small voice gently pleads for a better choice, bidding me selfish aims to leave and to God's holy will to cleave. Only one life, it will soon be past. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, a few brief years, each with its burdens, hopes and fears. Each with its clays I must fulfil, living for self or in his will. Only one life, it will soon be past. Only what's done for Christ will last. And when I am dying, how happy I'll be if the lamp of my life has burned out for thee. Brothers and sisters, let's, let's pray together now. Let's pray. Father God, thank you, thank you so much for sending Jesus, your Messiah, your Son, to bring about your kingdom. Thank you that he calls us to follow him, to give up our lives and this world for the certain hope of eternity with you. Father God, please 
would you forgive us when we fail to live up to Jesus' call? Father, forgive us when we're ashamed of your words and you're in the face of our world. Father God, please would you help us to live boldly following Jesus' footsteps, living for the kingdom to come. Help us to live proclaiming his kingdom for your glory. Amen.